In the family where I grew up, we placed great importance on putting up and storing food in the fruit room, canning it, or in freezers, freezing it. In our basement, we had a chest freezer that was so large that it needed two doors at the top to get into it all the way across in that chest freezer. Besides that, across the room from it, there was a full-size um, upright freezer, and both of them were completely jam-packed at all times with food of every variety. When my parents got to be uh, empty nesters, it was just the two of them, they started to think this was overdoing it and uh, that they maybe didn't need both of those freezers in their basement, and they determined that they would empty out the upright one and give that freezer to Sarah and Greg. Only they completely failed because they gardened way too much for that ever to happen. So in frustration, they simply unplugged it and brought the whole full freezer to our house and said, here, this is yours now. Uh, we wi wipe our hands of it. As a family, we did take food production very seriously. My parents grew up in the Depression. You did not waste produce, you put it up in any way you could. And if you had an apple that had a worm or bugs or a rotten spot on it, you didn't just throw that apple away. There's plenty of good apple on the other side. You know, you ate the other half of it. My dad would say, that's good eating over there, you know. Or, or you made sauce or you did something with it, you know. And to this day, I am a member of the Clean Plate Club. And if the dog gets the bones off my plate, it's pretty slim pickings off and then comes off of there. So I think I know what's going on in the reading from Isaiah where it says, As when juice is still found in a cluster of grapes and people say, Don't destroy it. There's still a blessing in it. Don't throw it out. There's still some good there. I think what's going on is that there's this bunch of grapes. And let's, let's just say it got to the back bottom of your crisper drawer and you forgot about them. And then, then you found them a little too late, and, and, and that, that it's not really moldy. Well, a few of them maybe, but they're kind of wrinkly, and they're not the best anymore, and no one is really excited about eating them, and somebody says, oh, we should throw these away, and somebody else says, don't throw them away. There's still some good ones there. God is like the voice that says, don't throw them away. There's still some good ones there, and the grapes are the people of the earth, you know, like, we're not so great, but God is looking for the good that is there. The way I am with food is a large part of it how I was raised. And I think every one of us here probably has, oh, ways that you were raised that were handed down to you from your parents, and you've got habits that go way back to childhood because of how your parents handed them down to you. You've altered them a little bit along the way, but there are still some of them that uh, formed you because of how you were raised. So I think on this Father's Day, it would be good for us to look at this text and to try to find, okay, what are the traits of God that he wants to pass down to people like us and to be alive in us? Well, verse 1 of our text, yeah, says, I have revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, here am I, here am I. The first aspect of what God is like in our text is that he is present for us and that he reaches out to connect with people that are his children or that he wants to be his children. Um, he establishes the bond with us first. One time I was talking with a woman and I said, tell me what your dad was like. And even though he had been dead for several years, she got all reminiscent, her, her eyes got, got moist, and she said, well, my dad was the kind of person who really held the family together. What kind of a person holds the family together? Someone who's involved, someone who gives of themselves, someone who's reaching out to make the connection with the members of the family. And God says he's like that. He's always will, wanting to pull people in 
even those who aren't looking for him, but he wants them in his family. So he's the first to take the first action. He kind of reaches out and says, you belong to me. He wants to be known, and he wants us to feel like we are known as well. One of our kids, when they were about two years old, had this very funny joke they liked to say. And you can imagine two-year-old humor. He used to go, knock, knock, and we would say, who's there? And he would say, me, which is very funny for a two-year-old to do. But wh what was he saying, really? He was saying, like, I'm here. I want to be noticed. I want to be important. I want to be, you know, part of this. And God says, okay, before you felt that way about me, I was already looking for you. That's what's on his heart. And in fact, he sounds almost desperate for that because he says in our text, all day long I held out my arms to an obstinate people. People who would never be his. It's like he stands there with arms outstretched waiting for the embrace, waiting for the love to be returned, and so often it just doesn't happen. Let's suppose you held your arms out to someone and you said, give us a hug. And they said, ew, no, and it went the other way. Would you continue to hold your arms out? Would you say, reconsider, please? Would you follow them, you know? Would you hold your arms out all day? Or would it sag like the letter F here? Kind of like, oh, man, it's hard to hold up. Would God says, all day long, I hold out my arms to an obstinate people. Can you imagine if you were the father in the story of the prodigal son and your son came back and you saw him a long way off and you ran out to him and you, in the story, they embrace. But what if, instead of that, the kid said, oh, I'm just here for some food. I don't want any of that. You know, how would that father feel? God is saying, that's me. And these people, so often, they don't let it happen. Instead, he says, they turn from me and walk in ways not good. What would you do in that circumstance? What do you do when a child of yours is walking down the wrong path? God says he's still there for them to welcome them back. He calls the path wrong. He doesn't just excuse it, but it's like he is still waiting for them, arms outstretched, because the alternative is a broken relationship, which God also knows the pain of and sometimes happens. It says in our text, they continually provoke me to my very face. And this is personal. This is like, I don't want you. This is like someone saying, I don't care what you're saying to me. I'm going this way. This is my life. I don't care about you. I had a father tell me one time, if that happened with them and their child, they would write to their child every day and say, I want to be a family. I want you to be my child and me to be your father. God says, I stand all day long with my arms wide open. So the first quality of God is that he is present there for us and he's reaching out to those that he wants to be his. The second quality is that God is gracious. He doesn't only be pre make himself present for us, but he is also full of forgiveness for people he knows have gone astray, like like the prodigal son father. He sees what's in our life, but he is ready to forgive and to welcome. He lists in our passage for today four particular kinds of sins that are, well, to God, they're like us telling him to get out of our life. Um, three of them are rather obvious. One, maybe not so much. The first one is where people have other gods in their life, like other things in their life that are so important, they're more important to them than God, and they look to them for like what's really good in life. This is where, what my life is all about, having other gods than him. The second thing he mentions is the occult, getting involved in that. I think that's what he was talking about when he mentioned people who are in the graveyards there, like seeking answers beyond the grave, uh, God says, you're doing that, you're not seeking me. I want to be the one with that role in your life. And third, and this is where people reject God by doing the exact opposite of what God says, like purposely. 
God had in the Old Testament given some very simple, clear rules about what to eat and what not to eat. And then he talks here about people eating the flesh of pigs and the broth of impure meat. It's like they're saying, okay, if that's what you said, I'm going to, um, if you said no, I'm going to say yes to that and doing the exact opposite. It's like an extra slap in the face to God. Those ones are rather obvious. The fourth one, maybe not quite as much. The fourth one is acting sanctimonious. In the words of our text where the person says, I am too holy for you. It's like when people think, um, you are not in my class as a God follower, so the, I don't have anything to do with you because uh, you know, I'm too good. And this is exactly the opposite of the attitude that Jesus had walking this world. And it is the exact opposite of what God wants people around this planet to experience when they encounter you as a follower of God. And these four things, God says, they are really irritating to him. He calls it like smoke in my nostrils, he said, a fire that keeps burning all day long. You ever sit around a campfire with friends and you're making maybe a dozen people, they're making a circle around the campfire, all except for that one quarter of the circle where the smoke is blowing. Nobody wants to sit there. But sometimes you're out around a campfire and there's a breeze that kind of shifts direction a lot, you know? And so the smoke, you, you're always watching it because sometimes it comes your direction and the people then say, oh, no, no, it's coming over here. Why can't it stay over there, you know? And God says, imagine if you sat around that fire all day and it just kept coming in your face. That's what it's like for me, he says. And I know some people who cannot abide smoke at all. It's almost like they're allergic, like their eyes get all watery and they're breathing. They can't really breathe. And you can't just say, oh, well, you ignore it. It's just a little smoke. For them, they can't. They, it, like living and smoke cannot coexist. With God, he's holy. God and sin cannot coexist. And he says, this is what it's like for me. Like smoke in my nostrils all day long. But he's also gracious. It's like even with this, he wants to reach out to those that are his and say, I forgive you. I want you to be mine. And in fact, in this passage where he says, my hands are outstretched all day long, I see it as a reference also to Jesus at the cross, who hour after hour kept his arms stretched out so that our sins and faults could be wiped away and we could have the righteousness of God as ours and we could be the forgiven children of God. God is that gracious. He is, however, also just. He doesn't just let things slide as if it didn't matter. He's got standards. He's got standards for us written in Scripture and they're also written for him. It says in our text, See, it stands written before me, which is like him saying, it's not going to change. This is right, this is wrong, and there are consequences. He says, I will not keep silent, but will pay back in full. I will pay it back into their laps, like if you keep going astray, this is the reality of what's going to happen to you. But why does he say in your lap? Kind of a strange phrase. Well, I remember a poem written by someone named Tina Trivet who wrote a poem about her grandmother, but more specifically about her grandmother's apron and all the things grandma did with her apron that reminded her of her grandmother and how this grandmother would, like if there's something that had to come out of the oven, she would bunch up the apron and use it like a hot pad to get the thing out of the oven. And if she was doing something at the sink and her hands were wet, she would dry them off on her apron. And if there was a kid whose face needed wiping, she would get the apron out for that kid. And if she needed to carry eggs or laundry or something, she would grab the bottom of the apron and pull it up like this and she'd have a little pouch to carry along, whatever she needed. And in Bible times, people wore robes, especially in the Old Testament, tied around with a belt. And if you needed to carry something, you could, you could pull up the robe a little bit and make yourself a pouch, you know. But whatever you carried was right there. So that was a good thing if you had bread, fresh bread, pretty nice. If you had old fish you needed to get rid of, there was also right there. So I think that's what God's trying to get at, what he says, the consequences are in your lap. It's like sometimes when we think about sin, it's, we, we make it something that's 
like way out there, uh, a little abstract, a little theoretical. And God says, oh, no, 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 no. The consequences of your actions are going to be right in front of your face, right under your nose, right part of your life. And he says, I will pay it back into their laps, both your sins and the sins of your ancestors. Why should we be punished for that? Well, I just think because the unresolved flaws and traits of parents are often picked up by children too. They don't just pick up the good stuff. A lot of times, unless they seriously say, I am not going to be like that, they pick up the bad habits and traits as well. And so a big part of who we are is what we pick up from our families. And sometimes it even affects our relationship to God. Dr. Phil once talked in an interview about this. I'm going to read a rather longer quote from him. He said, My dad said something to me at one time that really resonated with me. We had really hard times during our lives. He was an alcoholic, and at times we were really combative, and we just did not get along. He got it under control, and he came back to me to really nurture that relationship. He said to me, do you know why I am working so hard on this? And I said, I guess it's because you feel so guilty for being so bad. He said, yeah, that's a part of it. But the truth is that I know your relationship with your Heavenly Father could be a reflection of your relationship with your worldly father. And if you don't trust me, and if you don't respect me, and if you don't really feel like you can count on me, then you may never trust, respect, and count on your Heavenly Father. And the worst thing I can do for you is to take that away from you. And I don't want that to happen because I'm going to die. And you're not going to have a father in this world. And you're going to have to have a Heavenly Father to turn to. And that's why I am working so hard on this. Which is why I think it's so important for us to look at the traits of God in Isaiah 65. Because no father, no earthly father gets it right all the time. And not only do the traits of God, if we, if we live them, bless our families directly, but they may have an effect on how kids, grandkids, the wider world um, connects with God because of what they see in his followers and in the parents especially. So we have seen that God is present and he wants to make that connection with his family. We have seen that he is gracious and forgiving, also just, and he's got standards and there are consequences. The final attribute of God that I see in this passage here is that God is a great encourager. You know, he sees the potential in people where others might not always see the good or the potential that's in them. We're back to that bunch of grapes again. You know, it wasn't perfect by any means. Some said, oh, just throw it out. But the voice said, there's still some good in it, some blessing in it. So if, if God has given you a relationship with a child in any form, or with other people even, I think it's because God has seen in you the potential to be a blessing to that person. And even if other people might think, oh, there's not much good in you, God sees that potential. I mean, just look at that gospel reading. Here was a guy who was demon-possessed by legions of demons. I mean, this was a guy that most people would have said, oh, just get him away from us. We don't want him anywhere near. There's no good in him. Make him gone. Jesus heals him. And the guy says, I want to go with you. And Jesus says, return home and tell how much God has done for you. Can you even begin to imagine how many bridges this guy had burned? With his family, with the neighbors, with where he had worked. Oh, he had made a mess, such a mess of things. And yet God tells him, go back there. There's something you can accomplish. In every one of our lives, God sees the blessing that we are and can be when we follow him and strive to live according to what God calls us to be. 
I can remember waiting for my dad to come home from work, knowing, oh, he's about to be home now. And when he gets home, saying, Dad's home, and then rushing off to look what was in his lunchbox and see if he had anything left in there. It was like a double blessing. He was there and maybe even some treats. This text was written to convince us that God is such a blessing in our life because he is present for us. He reaches out to form that connection with us. He is gracious and also just and a great encourager. And his arms are open to us all day long. Amen.